During the Persian Gulf War, an elite team of British SAS commandos infiltrates Iraq. Their mission, to disable a network of mobile Scud missile launchers. The team is compromised, deep behind enemy lines. With 120 miles to the border and the Iraqi army at their backs, the men of Bravo 2-0 face a new mission, to survive. In an era of global violence, a new breed of warrior has emerged to counter the threat. Superbly trained, fearless, and equipped with massive firepower, these men are an elite few. Their teams are hand-picked, their operations covert, their missions deadly. From around the globe, these are the untold stories of the special forces. On January 17, 1991, a U.S.-led coalition launched a massive air war in response to the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. Operation Desert Storm had begun. Laser and satellite-guided missiles dramatically reduced the risk of Allied casualties. It promised to be a clean, high-tech war. Iraqi President Saddam Hussein vowed to retaliate. He unleashed wave after wave of Scud missiles at cities in Israel and Saudi Arabia. Airstrikes proved useless against the Scuds. The missiles were mounted on mobile launchers and eluded aerial surveillance. The coalition would have to fight the Scuds the old-fashioned way, with men on the ground. All right, lads, carry on, but listen up. This is the information we've got. A mission this dangerous required a high level of training. Team Bravo 2-0 of the British SAS was briefed at a forward operating base. Efforts by the coalition air forces to suppress the Iraqi launches of Scud missiles against Israel and Saudi Arabia have been a failure thus far. Formed in World War II, the SAS, or Special Air Service, is the most experienced special forces unit in the world. Key portions of the targets, most notable... The eight men of Bravo 2-0 would be dropped behind enemy lines for 10 days. Identified before the 7th of January. Their mission, to track mobile Scud launchers along a major supply route, or MSR. Andy, can I have a word? Sergeant Andy McNabb would lead the dangerous operation. He and his men were also ordered to destroy a fiber optic cable running alongside the MSR. Fiber optic cables. Wait. Follow it was a crucial target. The cable linked Scud missile launchers to Iraqi command and control. To sever that link, they first had to find it. Andy McNabb's identity is protected for security reasons. The problem was there was no information, very little mapping, and no satellite imagery of the area that we we're going to operate in. You've just got to get out there. And the argument is, well, that's what special forces do. Sometimes they go in without any information whatsoever because they're there to gather it. When you land, find a light-up position with close proximity to the main supply route. You're going to have to dig into the sand to create your LUP. The flat desert terrain would offer little cover. The squad would have to dig trenches or lie up positions to hide in. Once we got on the ground, our biggest weapon would be concealment. We're not going to be moving in the daylight. What we're going to be doing is hiding up in a lie up position, an LUP, in the daylight hours. During the night, we would then go out and operate. If we haven't heard from you within 48 hours, make your way back to the rendezvous point right here, and we'll have a helicopter there ready to come and meet you. The way that we operate is in small groups, maybe four, eight, 12 men, going in for a surgical strike uh, to hit a target and get in there quickly and come out even quicker. Bravo 2-0 geared up 
and prep the mission. Every body in that patrol, all eight of us, get in, we start and plan and prepare the operation. Because of everybody's background being so different, teamwork is so important. At 24, Bob was the youngest member of the team. He had been in the SAS six months. Chris Ryan, a six-year veteran, was the unit's medic. Mike joined the SAS from New Zealand. Stan, an Australian, was a demolition expert. From a commander's point of view, you're getting a lot of different types of experiences. Everybody feels that they're part of the job. Vince brought 20 years of experience to the team. Dinger had specialized training as a paratrooper. Steve Lane, known as Legs, was Bravo 20's communications expert. The team would use a short burst radio to stay in touch with headquarters in Saudi Arabia. This radio is designed to prevent enemy eavesdropping. As a backup, they also carried a TAC-B, a limited range emergency radio. For navigation, they packed a global positioning satellite device, or GPS. On January 22nd, the SAS boarded a helicopter for the flight into Iraq. Chris Ryan had no illusions about the nature of the mission. It was quite a, an emotional event because I think everybody had a fair idea that this was going to be a one-way ticket. So we set off farewells, got on board the helicopter, and then flew into Iraq. Looking out the windows, you, you, know, you could see quite far, and, and the ground was very flat. Uh, the ambient light was, was very good. The helicopter raced 20 yards off the ground to avoid enemy radar. The helicopter didn't have any armaments on. I mean, the crew were very brave. If we downed the aircraft, they were just to attach themselves to us, and we would, we would bring them out. Uh, these lads hadn't been trained in escape and evasion or anything, so you know, they, were, they were taking a huge risk.